Good afternoon, um, and welcome for the second session in the Cloud Open. Uh, so this session is about uh, modern programming languages for cloud native applications. Now, um, so we can talk about why cloud native applications are special and what's wrong with existing programming language abstractions like functions, modules, um, objects, right? So that's sort of the uh, gist of the talk today. Um, so, so the first talk um, was an excellent presentation done by Jim um, at Solo Inc. He explained running microservices at scale. Right? That is, he addresses the deployment side of microservices or cloud native applications. So this session, I'm going to look at the development aspects of microservices. Right? That's the uh, sort of the topic. So I'm Samir Jayasoma. Um, I'm from a company called, I work for a company called WSO2. Um, I'm a Java developer. Uh, I've been writing Java code for about 15 years now. So um, recently I joined um, the Ballerina project, which is an open source project um, sponsored by WSO2. Uh, Ballerina Lang is a program, new programming language that we are working on. Um, so today I'll have examples from Java, C Sharp, Ballerina, like a bunch of languages to explain what are these modern programming language abstractions. So let's get started. All right. So what are cloud native applications? Um, so this is this topic is I'm sure you all are aware of, but I'm just gonna uh, have this slide to explain the context here. So this is th this debate is well established now. What are monoliths? What are microservices based applications? So I'm not gonna um, spend more time here, but the idea is when you look at a monolithic application, um, yeah, all the code layers, boundaries, software components, they are usually in the same process, right? So, and multiple teams are working on this uh, monolithic application. You can see different layers, and each layer has a boundary, and then probably um, there are several components in a boundary, um, and each team Maybe working on that boundary. So there are a lot of complexity in these applications. So, and there are languages um, has evolved to handle this complexity. Now, now when you move from a monolithic application to microservices application, the, the fundamental idea is decomposition. You decompose a monolithic application into smaller components. And these smaller components talk to each other over the network using different protocols like HTTP, gRPC, GraphQL, using different message formats, JSON, protobuf, and things like that. So that's the fundamental difference here. So these smaller components, most of the time, they have network interfaces, they talk to other services, right? And they communicate using plain data, right? So that's, those are the fundamental differences. Um, and it's funny, like, people who have started uh, migrating from monolith to microservices. Some people are in their journey modernizing their applications, and some people, they have all done it. Now they're coming back to monoliths, so that so everything is happening here. Um, but I think the, the core idea is sort of settled now. Um, so this is a sample application. Um, I took it from Google uh, microservices demo application. It's not a real-world application. It's an application Google Cloud has developed to showcase their capabilities, right? This is that application. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit more time here uh, explaining this. I'm, I'm going to switch to my, um, so they are open source, I think. Let me see whether I have it, yeah. So this is basically, if you want to look at the code of this sample application, this is the place, right? You can go check out this um, example. Here, um, let me, like this, I'm going to scroll down to um, show you the application architecture here. So this microservices application has several components. Right? You can see um, front end, bunch of services talking to databases, Redis cache, like different components, and these are the net, these are their interactions. So you can think of them as network interactions. Right? Um, so this is the high level architecture. This is a hand drawn diagram. Now. And these services are written in different languages, just to showcase Google Cloud uh, capabilities. These are written in different different languages, right? So we, I basically 
Um, let me find my window. So I uh, rewrote this application uh, with, with another colleagues using different, uh, basically, this is a rewritten, the same concept, but with a, another set of abstractions. Now with that, um, sorry, let's look at the architecture of this diagram, of this product. So you, you can see the same code base, the ad service, card service, front end, everything is same. Same concept, same network interactions. But here, uh, I just visualized the architecture. Previously used for the handwritten diagram. Now this is completely generated from the code. So this image will not usually go out of sync with the, with the code. Like it's the code and it's right. So this, is, this shows certain uh, interactions between different components, right? Now, these are service interactions, but you can go one level deeper, as in, I want to see what's in each of these services, right? So this is an HTTP service I'm selecting, and this, the, all the internal services are gRPC services, right? So if I go here, I, uh, I'm, now I'm looking at a little bit complicated image, but essentially what you are seeing here is the details or the interface of each of the services. Now, the first one is an HTTP service. You can see what are the resources that are there, right? So you, it's like visualizing. Um, so you can see certain verbs, HTTP verbs, get, put, post, delete, and what are the resource names. So when you select on one resource, you can see that this get metadata resource internally talk to cart service and the currency service. So the card service and currency service, they are gRPC services. So you see a different perspective there, as in RPC, you can see in the card, add item, get card, sort of methods. In the HTTP world, you look at the world as a resource-oriented view. Right? You can see resources and actions on them. So that's HTTP and gRPC difference. Now, this shows individual resources and their interactions. I'm going to go, I'm going to, go to a one level deeper now. Um, if I click on the here, I can go to source or design. So design means uh, I clicked on the metadata, get metadata resource. This shows me, this visualizes the code now. So this is exactly the code that is there in that resource. Um, here, this is the, um, the resource code. And it's complicated as in you have if files, while loops. It's complicated and we don't need these details. But what, what we are really interested in is the network interactions. So if I do this, you can see that um, my resource connect to two different services, but I can hide all the complexity and just look at the network interactions. So and then you will clearly see this resource connect to get the card service first, and then it connects to currency service. Now, these visualizations, these are possible because of the abstractions in, in, in these languages. Right? These are all uh, generated, not handwritten diagrams. So we're going to talk about some of these um, abstractions today. Let me go back to the slides. All right. OK, so now if I focus on one of the components, like in this image, the previous image, one of the components, you will typically see this structure where it's a service. Um, there's a web browser or a client is talking to them. And then that service typically talk to other services. But what's special here is these components work with data all the time. It's all about data. You receive data, maybe via JSON or Protobuf. Then you pass data into an application specific type. Then you manipulate that. Then you send data back to some internal service or the database. So if you look at any of the small components, this is sort of the high level view that you see. Right? There may not be complicated layers in each of these components. That's the pattern that we have seen. Okay, so. Now, how do we write um, these applications? What are the abstractions that, we, that are there in programming languages? So this slide sort of groups these modern abstractions 
into multiple buckets. So the pattern that I have seen is you can organize them as data abstractions, you can organize them as network abstractions, and you can organize them as concurrency abstractions. So today I'm going to talk about first two. I don't think I have time for the last one, but let's see how it goes. So my focus is on data and network abstractions today. And we look at how different languages um, handle these cases. Right? So, so these are the high level abstractions. Now, how do you add these abstractions into languages? There are two choices I have seen. First, um, if you look at Java, the good example, like Java is innovating super fast these days. They have six, six months release cadence. So what they're doing is they are introducing new language features or features like every six months. What they are doing is they are basically modernizing Java into writing modern cloud native applications. Right? So they are basically evolving Java to support modern abstractions, to introduce modern abstractions. I have some slides explaining what are those. Then the other approach that I have seen is people are designing new languages because sometimes um, these three abstractions they are sometimes deeply interconnected to each other. So you may not be able to uh, evolve existing languages uh, properly to handle them. So some designers, they are basically creating new languages with deeply connected abstractions that works like seamlessly well. Right? So let's see. The first one is data abstractions. So data abstractions is, um, how you handle data, how you represent data, how you describe data that are coming over the wire, right? And how you manipulate. So these are the three aspects. So uh, I'm using some examples from this book. Um, I think you can, if you have the slides, you should be able to look at the link. So this, this book is um, Object, sorry, Data Oriented Programming. It's a decent book. I read it and I agree with most of the uh, points there. But um, I have some disagreements as well. So there are some, some um, things with the author. Uh, that's a different uh, problem. Anyway, so that book says, so data-oriented programming is not new. It's been there. People are practicing it. This book has a like, nice way of arranging the content. So it book says, represent data as data, not data as, let's say, objects. So because if you think of objects, you have code and data bundled together. That may not be the natural way to represent data. So this book goes on to say, you represent data as data, so when you work with data, it has to feel natural. Right? So let's uh, take a look. And also it says, it talks about plain data. So the, what do you mean by plain data? So in, in all of these microservice applications, we work with plain data. It's that what's coming on the wire, what's coming over the wire, is plain data, like it's a JSON payload, it's a protobuf, there's no behavior associated, there's no meaning associated, I'll get, get to that point. When you look at the data, you see the structure, but there's no meaning, I'll get to that point. Okay, so, so the next point is, we're gonna look at double OP, object-oriented programming, and also data-oriented programming, and evaluate whether which approach is right for cloud native application development. Now, object oriented programming is great, right? There's no question about it. It worked well for monolithic applications where you have, where you have complicated boundaries um, and it's good at encapsulating things, right? So uh, it worked great and people are still, still using it. No, there's no question about it. But now the question is, does it work for cloud native applications? Does it work for smaller components where you don't need to have that complicated layers, complicated boundaries? So that's the topic we are gonna talk about, right? Uh, because when you look at these containers and microservice applications, um, the layer or the boundary is a network. You have smaller components and their boundary is a network. They talk to each other over the network. But within that boundary, what's happening is usually simple. You, you get some data, you talk to the database, 
or you talk to some other uh, service, you combine, you blend everything in, into a single response, pass it back. Right? Why do we need complicated layers? So whereas data-oriented programming talk about like representing data as data and keep code that processes data separate from um, data. So it's just two different concepts. Um, you can pick and choose. You can, if your microservice is complicated, use double OP. If it's a simple, use data-oriented. There's no silver bullet, um, right? All right. So data abstractions, there are three, we can look at data abstraction in three different ways. One is how do you describe data? Like what is the application level type that I'm gonna to use to describe data? And how, how easy it is to describe data? Like create data, like data literals, records, open records, openness of a, a type, the structural aspects of the type. Then, then the next one is manipulation. How easy it is to manipulate data inside that boundary. Then of, of course communication, like how easy it is to uh, get some data from the wire and transform that to application type, etc. All right. So this is a simple JSON payload. As you can see, the bunch of key value pairs, a JSON object, uh, you can interpret this in different ways. So I can see first name, last name. This has to be a person. And also there's a books field, field name books, and that's an array. That array has, it's an array of JSON objects again. Right? That can be books. When you look at this, you can clearly see the structure of data. You can see the structure, but What's the meaning? How do you, what's the semantics? What are the semantics of the data? How do you interpret it? How do you describe it in the programming language? One option is this may be a person who owns these books. Right? I don't know. Maybe it's a, it's a library member who borrowed these books. But two different things, but the data is the same. So we can interpret this data in different ways. So that's about describing data. So we, uh, we use to describe this data in programming languages, we use data types, right? For integer, int. Like for this, this is a Java way of doing it now. In Java, we used to have these pojos where you write plain all Java objects, you have getters, setters, private fields. That's how we represent the data in Java. But with the new Java innovation, they have something called records, right? You can use Java records and you can represent this tree data structure. So here, we have a member record, last name, first name, and then bunch of books. Then we have a book record, title and author, and then, right, so you can see the association between these records. So this is, in Java, this is the best way to represent data. Now, and then in the main method here, I don't, I'm not sure whether you can see, in the main method, we are creating a data literal. We are creating um, a record called Kelly with this information, right? So this is Java way of doing it. In Java, everything is an object, so that's why you see even for records, you have new um, sort of, sometimes for some of you, it may not feel that natural, because if you look at the JSON, this is a JSON literal. This is how you see JSON, right? But this is in Java, so it, it's perfect. It works for Java. Right? So I'm going to look at a Balna example now. Right? So this is how you do the same thing in Ballerina. So in Ballerina, there's something called records. Um, so you have author record, book record, and then member. On the, on the other side, I'm creating the same, same um, so let's say, an instance of the member record. But when you compare that with that, looks like the JSON. The only difference is um, these keys, there's no quotes around it. So I'm gonna go back to JSON for a second. So JSON, you have these quotes, and here there's no quotes, so that, that's a slight different, but you write the data literal, it's the same, right? So those are the differences. I'm, I'm, I can talk about Kotlin data classes as well, same concept, but, um, I'll stop here. 
Okay, so the, this example is about algebraic types in Java. So Java uh, field classes, the idea here is how you represent choices in something. I'll take an example in the same member. So the, let's say member is a generic concept where you have, um, let's say, a regular member and a VIP member. Now this is a choice. Now uh, field class means the, the developer who works on this can define these choices, but no one else can extend it. So that's the idea of Java field class. I'm, not sure, I'm sure we are familiar with it. Um, so that gives a nice way to compile time check. Um, like uh, it's sort of closed. You can, uh, you can at compile time, you can check whether this uh, member is a regular member or a uh, VIP member. Now here they have used, this is I took this example from the Java article. What it says is, uh, it's how you represent JSON in Java. Like if you look at the JSON specification, um, you can see that JSON is a union of things. A JSON can be a simple number, JSON can be a string, JSON can be a JSON object, a JSON can be an array of anything, array of integers, array of string, array of JSON objects, so it, it goes on. Right? JSON is something like that. So here, if you look at this, a JSON value uh, is a combination of uh, strings, numbers, nil, boolean, arrays, and objects. So this is how you represent JSON in, now JSON in Java. And in the main method, uh, you are creating a new JSON value, and in the if condition, what's happening here is you are checking whether this JSON value has a certain structure. So you're looking at the structure here, right? Not really, it doesn't matter anything, but it looks at the structure, and then if the structure is okay, inside the if condition, uh, you can access those fields in a type safe way, right? So this is how you do that in Java, right? Um, let's say how, how uh, this is how you do that let's say in ballerina, right? In ballerina, um, there's a type called JSON, the built-in type defined in the language. Um, so here is that type. Here I'm defining that data literal. The same thing we have done in here as well. The same thing, but in a different syntax, right? And I'm, I'm now, what I'm saying here is, I'm looking at the JSON here, and I'm asking whether uh, this JSON value, does it look like the person? Does it look like a person? Right? Th that's what I'm doing here, JSON from JSON with type. What it simply means is I'm checking whether this JSON value looks like the person type defines here right? at runtime because I don't know what the message I'm getting. So I'm going to simply do a check here and saying, um, and that can fail because sometimes they are, the JSON may not look like the person. So it's going to give me an error. So I had to handle error. So I'm here I'm just printing it. But if that JSON looks like the person, I'm getting a person back. It's the same thing. Now I can access these fields in a type safe way. So same thing, but in two different syntaxes. So the languages are evolving to handle data in a natural way. Like if you look at Kotlin, the same, same aspect. All right. Now. I took this Balna example, but you can see this is pretty common. You can see this behavior in Java, C Sharp, C Sharp, like I think first one to introduce it, uh, like in, in mainstream languages. So this is like sort of a declarative way of manipulating and querying data, right? This is like SQL is doing it. Right? So here, what I'm doing here um, is basically looking at all the countries. I'm getting list of countries somehow, and I'm iterating the countries and basically um, filtering out countries with this condition, and then creating a local variable, calculating the case fatal ratio using the deaths and cases, and sorting it, and limiting it to 10, and selecting all the countries. What I'm getting back is a JSON. So that's simple data filtering. Now, this is readable. This is like, if you come back after six months, you can still understand this. Um, Right, so this is like uh, certain abstractions that you see. So next one is consuming services, as in how easy it is to manipulate or like, accept data from or send data from um, network boundaries. Now, 
here, I have defined a type called country. This is sort of the expected structure of data. This is what I expect from the service. Now, in the main function, I create HTTP client to a random URL, um, and I'm doing a get request here. Right? I'm doing a get request here, um, and I'm getting back a list of countries. So here, I'm not worrying about um, JSON serialization, JSON passing, or anything like that. Um, this, I'm, as a developer, I worked at a little bit higher level now. Right? And I describe my expected uh, structure of data. I'm getting a list of countries here. So it's sort of like the data validation as well. And if it fails, it's going to return an error. So this check is doing that. Because uh, if what I'm getting back is not a list of countries, it will check. Check means in Ballerina, it's just return from the function. So it's like eliminating the error. If it's countries, I'm going to print it. So that's very simple. Um, so here, what I'm doing is I'm doing two things. I'm describing the data format or data structure, and I'm also using that to validate the response that I'm getting back from the client. We can go one more step here. This is, again, data validation, but with additional constraints. I'm saying I want this country, list of countries, but the population has to be greater than this number. Death has to be greater than this number. This is, again, you are describing the structure of the data, and also you are like enforcing a little bit more constraints. Right? So, so, so this is like, you can see this in Java as well. Um, and so that's one thing. OK. So, um, so I, I was like um, talking about mostly data abstractions. Right? And then and what, what that means is now all this comes down to, as a, for me as a developer, I, I don't have to deal with a lot of boilerplate. I'm getting simple. I'm, I can think in terms of these um, simple abstractions. I can write my code. Because when you look at these smaller components, most of the cases, um, you don't have to, um, like, it's not complicated. You don't have to deal with a lot of things. Uh, and it depends on the service as well. So the idea is abstractions as a developer helps me to think in terms of high level concepts. I don't have to go into the details, JSON passing, and all that. Right, so that's one advantage. So the next one here is, is sort of net, network abstractions. I talk about data abstractions. A network, let's look at network abstractions. They are deeply connected to each other. Um, right. So here, um, if you look at uh, all the network libraries, um, HTTP clients, HTTP service libraries in all the languages, what you see you see it's like similar abstractions in, in, in all of the modern uh, frameworks and languages. Right? So you see a concept called listener. Listener is listening, um, let's say, on the port. Listener can be like different types. It can be HTTP listener, GraphQL, gRPC, so different concepts. Now, listener basically accepts request, and then based on like, the nature of the request, it's the path. It's the, let's say, method name in gRPC. It dispatched to services. A listener can handle multiple services, of course. Um, if it's HTTP listener, then it depends the base path and the resource signature. Right? So inside the service, usually you manipulate data, and then you talk to a backend. It could be a database. It could be another service. Now, the abstraction that I'm seeing here is is something called client. This is like pretty uh, standard. Like the other term is stub, right? You create a stub. But that, that essentially, what I see is that as an abstraction, because as a, as a service developer, I don't directly go to the service. I talk to the service via this client abstraction. Now, service and client communication, I can classify them as network interactions. So the, the, if you think of that way. Um, the service and client interactions, you can think of them as network abstractions, network interactions. And um, if you look at, the, look at it that way, then your network interactions are explicit. And then as a developer, I know I'm interacting with the network. And I know these network calls can fail. I have to think of error handling as well explicitly. 
So the, the, the things change. We'll look at those examples as well. Right? So that's sort of, these are the high level concepts that I see in, 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 in like dealing with network boundaries. So, but if you look at this chain, everything that flows through is data. That's why uh, describing and manipulation data is important. All right. So this is a bit about services. Just to, um, services, services, I think I explained this um, in the demo as well. So services can be of different types. The HTTP services, you have sort of a resource-oriented view. You have um, sort of resources like metadata, um, cart. There's one exception here, set currency. I really don't like that uh, name. It has to be currency. Some, like you are posting, some, you are changing something. Uh, set currency is like, I would uh, write this as currency. Anyway, so but, but the idea is you have these actions and resources, right? And in the gRPC world, it's sort of RPC, so you, what you see is always remote methods. So different kinds of services and different, kind, different ways of thinking about them. Um, I'll get to those in a second. So this example is from ASP.NET minimal APIs. Um, so here, this is an HTTP service, um, and it manages to-do list, right? It's simple. Um, so as you can see, for each resource path, you can attach a handler, a function, right? This function, basically, when, you, when, when this service receives a request, let's say, um, to-do item by ID, uh, this handler will invoke, and here, what it does is talk to database, see whether there exists um, ID with the database. If the is, return an HTTP OK response. If not, 404, like not found. Now, this is explicit. I mean, this is explicit in the code. The advantage here is now, this code, this is a service, you can easily generate an open API description for this, right? So, um, I mean, that's why in, when I read the .NET, it says you have to use, like, it's best practice to use type results so that the open API generation works because you are pretty precisely say, saying that this is um, the resource path, you can invoke it. If you invoke it, this is, these are the results. So the open API generation tools, they look at the code and figure out this is, has to be um, the service, right? So that works. Now, this is like how we do the same thing in Ballerina. So in Ballerina is a new language, so uh, example of existing language and adapting to um, services. This is a new language. How do you design new language? So here, service is uh, a concept, a first-class citizen in, in the language, just like function and classes. A service is a first-class concept, and a service can have, service can get attached to a listener. Here, this, I'm using HTTP listener, so this has to be an HTTP service. So the structure here is, a service can have multiple resources. Resource function get to do. And remember the HTTP uh, resource-oriented view? The way it is designed in Balna is using this resource function concept, and you have the action as a separate and the path as separate. So there are different ways of doing things here. I'm just, um, so here, if you look at this uh, resource path, we have an ID, and it returns a to-do element or not found. Now, if you look at all the resource signatures, you can see the behavior of the service. When you invoke a resource function, you can precisely see what you get. Similar, um, sorry, similar to GotNet, the same thing. The difference is, uh, it's evident in the signature, so you can generate open API descriptions, and if you have an open API description, you can get the source code as well. So the, the, these things are, allows you to uh, do that. Now, the next one is, sort of the visualization of the service as a Soga, Soga editor. Right, so this sort of uh, coming from the VS Code tooling. You, if you write the service, you can visualize it, you can, give, you can try it, and you can see what's happening. This is another view of uh, the open API description. Right? All right, so the same thing, um, 
Like now the gRPC example, this is gRPC in C Sharp. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the proto file, but it's the same uh, standard proto file that they are using to explain gRPC. Uh, there's one method, say hello. Uh, it accepts the hello request, hello reply, pretty standard. Um, and in Ballerina example, it's the same. You have a service. Now in this time, we have a gRPC listener instead of HTTP. Now we have, uh, earlier we had remote resource functions. Now we have remote functions. So in Ballerina, the way um, you can think of services being um, a collection of resource functions or a collection of remote functions, depending on the protocol, right? Uh, just um, how, how they have designed it. Um, all right. So these abstractions, I'm not going to spend more time here. Um, so these abstractions, uh, these are the advantages of having higher level abstractions uh, as a developer. So I get the d data serialization, deserialization uh, automatic, and that is more, more common now nowadays. Um, and data validation at the boundary. Before I work with data, I need to know the data I get is correct. So data validation at the boundary is that. So you can have, you can describe the data, you can have additional constraints, um, and in your business logic, it's safe to work with data. So you have guaranteed that. Otherwise, you, uh, you refuse to accept requests. Um, and then bidirectional mapping between IDL to code. The IDL is, I think, uh, interface description language, as in it depends on the protocol. If it's gRPC, protofiles. If it's GraphQL, it's GraphQL scheme, I guess. If it's HTTP, if it's open API. So what these abstractions help you do is, if you have an IDL, you can generate the service. If you have the service, you can also generate the IDL. So you can have a code first, contracts first, it doesn't matter. Um, the other thing is network observability, code to cloud means when you write the service, it, this, these abstractions help you to generate Docker files, Kubernetes, YAML files, everything. There are samples around. I'm not going to cover that. Obviously, the application architecture. So what you saw earlier, the demo, how you visualize application, it's all based on the abstractions. And it's visible in the code. That's how a developer think of that application. Um, yeah. So client abstraction is the same. Helps you to, uh, I have some examples in the clients as well. So helps you to work uh, in terms of network interactions. So you can think of uh, explicit network errors and things like that. So this is um, an example written in Ballerina. Um, so where the idea is it first create a GitHub HTTP client, and then it does a get request to this resource, repository pools, headers, um, it bypassing headers. You get a list of PRs back. Then it creates a client to the Google, um, Google Sheets API. This is a generated client. Um, and then it dumps all PRs into, uh, as rows. Right, that's a simple integration, right? Um, this is, now, if you see here, from GitHub, what you get is a list of PRs, right? Uh, check means, like, there are network failures, there are data validation failures, and things like that. Same here. So you're working at a little bit higher level uh, than you used to be. Um, and, then, and, then, and then as you see here, this arrow here indicates it's a network. So this GitHub is a client abstraction. And this arrow means you are doing a network interaction. So ideally, this GitHub is, is an, let's say it's an object in my, my same process. Ideally, they are not interactions, but this abstraction, this client is like a proxy to the backend service. So it helps you to think that you are explicitly doing network interactions. You have to handle errors. Here, I'm not handling errors. I'm just passing. But I, of course, I can handle the error. Right? So with that, uh, I get, I can easily visualize this code as a sequence diagram. Because when I, let me go back to the code. Here, I know that this is a client. I know that this is a network interaction. I know this is a client. And then, then I can see this is a network interaction, this is a network interaction. So when you look at this image, um, you can see there are, you can see the GitHub um, service, you can see the G Sheet service, and multiple network interactions. So this is all visualized from the code, not, not a handwritten diagram. 
I, this is what abstraction, sometimes you can come back to code in six months and you can see what's happening. All right, so, so that brings me to the summary. Um, so at the beginning, I, I talked about data and network and concurrency. I don't think I have almost 40 minutes on time, but um, the concurrency abstractions, like I'll explain briefly. Uh, it's another talk. So we have this uh, lightweight threads that are coming in Java, and Go has already done that. Now, Balna is also like lightweight threads. It helps you to write um, structured concurrent code, as in it's not like, um, let's say, you can compare async await versus writing concurrent code as blocking code. So that there's different, um, if you're interested to read about structured concurrency. The other one is uh, concurrency safety. These abstractions, now some of these languages, helps you to detect concurrency related errors at compile time. So compile, uh, concurrency safety at compile time. Most of the cases you can do. So that, 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 good, that's, that will be another topic. So um, I guess I'll stop at that point. Um, so thank you for joining. Thank you, everyone. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, if you look, if you model these as objects, then I can decide which fields are private, which fields are accessible like that, right? So in, in, um, that's a fair point. Maybe some use cases, it's valid. Um, but in some use cases, the way I have seen is, uh, another way to, uh, let's say, implement your scenario is, uh, let's say this JSON example. Uh, for some functions or some areas, you don't want to expose books. You want to give just the first name, last name, right? But what you have is this, let's say this, this case, member. So what I have seen is um, you can create, now if you look at the structure of the data, there's this concept called open records. I think I, I, I have this um, here, this, this one. Um, data representation, open records in the middle. The, the reason is when you create these records, Let's, I'll, I'll go to the Balna, um, because the question is asked. These records are open by default, as in, um, when, I, uh, when I create data literals, I have to have all the four fields, but you can have additional fields. And the way I, I, way I, I have implemented a similar example, the way I have done it, I have another member, let's say member without books, where I don't have books fields in that case, but I have only these ones. So what I do is, uh, from that member, I basically assign that member to uh, the member without books and pass it to the other functions. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so in, it is in, in, I mean, let's say if you are thinking about like complicated application with layers, that can be a problem because then you have to manage all the types. But I have seen um, even in that Google microservices demo, um, in some of the uh, services, there are a bunch of types for various uh, parts of the application. You convert your data into that type and pass it back. Um, that's a way of hiding um, in, in the data-oriented programming. Uh, you always look at the data in, in a different lens, and then what do you call it, like uh, projection, right? You have the full data, and then you create another type by selecting the fields that you need. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a good point, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.